bags in paraffin and uh, rubbing the engine down and, and then polishing it off afterwards. It was really dirty. Sometimes you really got a, a messy job where there'd been a suicide or, or something and um, it, it was not very pleasant, I can tell you. Even cattle we, we've had to clean uh, from underneath locomotives. Oh, you was absolutely filthy. But your broke fingernails when you went out on a Saturday night, you, the girls could tell you worked on the British Rail. You could smell the, the oil in your nails. There's no such thing as an airbrush, of course. So, yeah, it's, uh, it was dirty. It was a world dominated by tradition. Station masters looked as if they'd stepped out of the Victorian age. And for women, equal opportunities seemed a world away. I started working on the railway in 1935, and it was only the typist jobs, really, that the girls did. Women could work on the railways as long as they stayed single. When a woman married, uh, she, she, uh, her employment finished the day before she got married. But she wasn't employed after that. I suppose we, we, we really accepted it because it was the usual thing. <laughs> We'd, uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't much good arguing about whether you accepted it or not because there was somebody else behind you ready to step into that job. Business appeared to be booming, but the first signs of crisis were appearing with pay cuts and short time working. The rail company struggled to make money. Even bigger problems were on the horizon. The railways were vital for the war effort, and that made York Station a target for German bombers. It was a clear, bright night, but cold. And uh, the first bombs dropped before the sirens went. You could hear the bombs falling all round. The whole place was shaking. Uh, I was terribly frightened, never been so frightened in my life. Uh, eventually the raid passed. I think it probably lasted for an hour and a half or perhaps two hours. Vernon Dugdale used to be an engine cleaner at York Station. He returns to the site of the train shed, now part of the National Railway Museum, where a bomb caused devastation. Two or three engines wrecked. Sir Alfred Wedgwood was one of them. It was partly on its side. There was uh, fire engines and fire hoses everywhere and smoke and flames still coming from the station. All this place was all covered in tiles and bits of roof. After a few hours they organised everybody and every able-bodied man was there shoveling up tiles and cleaning up the debris. The bombers also brought the threat of chemical attack. In these pictures, never seen before on television, workers practice dealing with mustard gas. The end of the war brought new opportunities for the nation, but what did it mean for the railways? Three years after the war, in 1948, came a defining moment the government nationalised the system, a new dawn which promised more investment and better industrial relations. With the introduction this week of the railway summer services, it's all clear for holidays and if the weather will organise itself too, we are all set for our own great day of the year, the day we go away. Everybody was full of hope. We were hoping that uh, with nationalisation we were going to get just what we wanted. But almost immediately, the old problems returned. The government promised a job for every demobbed serviceman, which led to overmanning. When I started on the, on the, on the British Rail, there was 400,000 members of the NUR. That was the NUR alone. In the ASL and ENF, the local drivers and firemen, there were 72,000 members. The men who ran British Rail, and they were mostly men, faced tough competition from the roads. Many rail workers felt their bosses weren't up to the job. 
the management of British Rail after the war certainly was left something to be desired because it was a job for the boys. Uh, there's no question about that. Management couldn't foresee everything. The worst winter on record stretched the system to its limits. In this rarely seen film, a railway company cameraman captures the conditions high on the Pennines. It was snowing, snowing, snow. It was terrible. And I jumped off my side to hook on. And believe you me, I went up to my waist in, in snow. It was, it was terrible. I used to run into the snow at 30 mile an hour until it stopped you. And then they used to dig it out in great chunks, because it, you know, it, when it, once it stopped you, it was solid. You see, and once they dug out all that away, you went back and had another go on. That's how you kept going till you got the line clear. I only went with the snow ploughs when they became derailed, because sometimes when they were ramming huge drifts at 25, 30 miles an hour, despite them being very heavy and full of weight to keep them on the track, they used to derail. So I only saw the derailment scene, but it was enough to be impressive. Uh, huge snow drifts of about 15 foot high in places. In dramatic attempts to open blocked lines, men set fire to the drifts. Then came even more desperate measures. It was the first time any of us had ever seen a jet engine. The idea was to turn the engine on to shift the snow. And believe you me, there were, there were blocks, oh, half the size of a garden shed going over the telephone wires but before they could switch the engine off, it had cleared the snow and cleared all the ballast out from between the sleepers. The sleepers were all, all bare, no ballast there at all. Worse was to come. The melted snow flooded vast areas, washing away miles of track. Only on weekends did we work in the rain. If it rained or snowed, or there was a blizzard, we didn't normally work, but on weekends where we had to work, then you jolly well had to get out in it and, and get soaked and frozen to death. There's a saying on the railway, in hail, rain, fog or falling snow, into the cabin you must go. <laughs> and that summed up the situation in bad weather. The job for life started with an apprenticeship Gordon Reed started straight from school as a young boiler man. I didn't want a nine till five, mamby pamby, five day week job. I wanted to be somewhere in the front line doing a man's job. And uh, by golly, I ended up doing a man's job. I did go to a grammar school. I have a bit of a, an honor at Newcastle Royal Grammar School. I'm the only boiler smith who ever went to that school. Everybody else were brain surgeons and doctors and lawyers, you know. <laughs> Working on the railways was dangerous. In one year alone, 64 track workers were killed and 37 injured. Serious accidents were a part of working life. We did have a boiler maker who was actually burned to death in a locomotive smoke box. Uh, that was caused by oxygen getting in his overalls using a uh, flame cutting equipment and it infiltrated into his overalls and then a spark went in and the poor chap was, uh, was killed, yes. What they call oxygen enrichment in the trade. Mm. Bernard McGreevy was a wagon repairer raising a young family. One day he decided to take his son and daughter to the engine workshop. We took both kiddies, Catherine and, and John. And at the time, I mean, our workshop was so noisy, it's quite unbelievable with the air guns, the riveting guns, all the machinery, and it was amazing. And as soon as Catherine got through the door, 
she just shrieked and ran out and I had to go chasing after and I hadn't realised the effect that the noise would have on a, a child of six. Initially we had no air, air protection whatsoever, no air defenders, no air muffs or anything. Eventually we uh, got the little orange air plugs uh, and we used to stick those in and they're quite good. They certainly stopped some of the noise. And in fact, when I finished work, I knew that my hearing had been affected due to industrial uh, indefinite. And I, I got a settlement uh, which was reasonable, I felt. Some dangers were readily apparent, but others were less obvious. This is asbestos, shot by an amateur cameraman. The substance was widely used in railway works throughout the 50s and 60s. It would haunt workers for generations. In York, Jeff and Eileen Sanderson were getting married. Jeff worked at the local carriage works. He went there as an apprentice when he was 15 in 1954. He loved it. He wouldn't have ever thought of going anywhere else. When they were actually working with the asbestos, they didn't know the dangers of it. And so he wouldn't come home and say, we've been you know, using this stuff that's poisonous, etc. And so he didn't really say very much at the time. I know he was working on doors, vestibules, when he worked nights. Ten years after leaving the carriage works, Jeff died of asbestos-related cancer. An awful lot of Jeff's friends that were apprentices with him have died with it. And each time, you hear of another death. I know how it affected Jeff. I just think, that's another one, that's another one. and. I know now that's how lads that he was apprentices with must be after Jeff died. And every time one of them gets ill, you're thinking, oh, I wonder if that's it, you know? Because it's just like a big black cloud hanging over him all the time. <laughs> 